there's a worse than Bud. People are always curious about the Amish. I know a lot about the Amish because I grew up here in PA in Lancaster County. Plus, my mom was a was a RN nurse. She also did. Um, she was also a travel nurse. So, like, if an Amish farm called, you know, and said, "Hey, we need a nurse," and they couldn't get to the hospital, she would go to their house, bandage them up, whatever. So, with horse and buggies, as you can know. Tragically, there's a lot of horse and buggy, buggy accidents with cars and everything, and unfortunately, some don't make it out alive. As you can see, here's why. So, and I'm not making this up because you can find it too. So, if you lift the back of that thing, you'll actually see the children and stuff having their heads out in the back of the wagon, acting like it's a fun ride and stuff. There are no seatbelts at all. So, that's why the children, it's easy for the children to either jump out, which hopefully they don't do that, or just to have have their heads in the back and we're talking about from like children probably from about two ages from a year old to probably about um I don't know 12 or so until they get to know better to sit down and all so then we're going to take a look at the buggy and you'll see what I'm talking about because I'm not making this up also too in the buggy they also um when they leave for the hospital sometimes they go to actual hospitals like we would the people that are not an Amish community like you know how we're not an Amish community and we go to the hospital to, like to deliver our babies and stuff well here when they go home from the hospital they ask do you have a driver because they must leave in the hospital with a baby car seat. The Amish do not use baby car seats. Um, they don't have to. They use a box. And I will show you where they set them in a box. on this side because obviously there's the pedal and then the box literally will be on the floor on the seat beside the driver and you can see them when they have and sometimes they open up that door so you'll see if the door is not open you'll actually see a toddler or an infant in the box on the floor. It's got an ashtray though. Whatever temperature it is, that's what temperature it's going to be. So you can see why the horse and buggies do break easily because they're made out of wood. So when you get into a car crash, that's why they don't make it out alive because they just have just wood and metal and when you see accidents you see it all smashed up in the buggy. It's sad, sad. Even the wheels come off. Depending on where it is. So there's your history of the horse and buggy. Yeah. <laughs> 
But it's true. Shoemaker, uh, Don Yoder, and William Fry. They were teaching at Franklin and Marshall College, uh, which is uh, in Lancaster. And they wanted to do a holistic presentation of life. And they were doing something really uh, revolutionary. Their idea was to bring people from the neighboring the towns and villages and have them actually display their life uh, in front of uh, outsiders. Um, and usually a folk festival was about singing. Usually there was a stage and a group of people would get up and sing. Uh, Shoemaker and Yoder felt uh, a folk festival should be more than just singing, it should also be people's entire lives. Uh, the work they did, uh, the food they cooked and ate, uh, how they harvested, uh, their religious beliefs, much more than just singing. And the idea was not to have uh, somebody uh, who was an academic like them do the presentation, but have the people who lived in the area themselves do it. And uh, this became, I'm pretty sure, the first what we would call folk life festival. There had been folk festivals before, uh, but this was the first effort to really look at people's lives in a, a kind of holistic, uh, full um, kind of way. And so uh, this is uh, how the festival uh, started. Um, one of the things, as the festival evolved, several things happened, uh, but uh, originally the festival really took off. It became something uh, that was really popular. I'll tell you, people in this area did not think it was going to go anywhere. Uh, they said, who's going to care about our lives? Who's going to want to eat our food? Who's going to want to do uh, what it is we're doing? Uh, but uh, it really caught on. It really exploded over time. Um, and I don't know, uh, it was something uh, that uh, really caught on. Um, one thing to keep in mind, the festival has changed. It's been here for 72 years. Um, in 1950, when Shoemaker and Yoder started it, um, you could have somebody uh, in this area, 75 years old, and they would have been brought up in a purely pre-mechanical -ag pre agricultural environment. They would have done their own harvesting. There would have been no gasoline-powered plows or threshing machines or anything like that. Uh, probably they spoke Pennsylvania Dutch as the first language. Uh, they probably did not uh, start speaking English until they started school. Um, they would have been uh, making their own food on the grounds. Uh, they really would have been immersed in a pre-industrial agricultural style. Uh, that would have been somebody born in 1875, the first year of the festival. And they would demonstrate uh, the life that uh, they knew today at that time, or the life that they knew uh, from their childhood. A 75-year-old today is really a different story. Born 1947, most likely that person does not speak Pennsylvania Dutch. Most likely, if they heard Pennsylvania Dutch, it was their grandparents speaking when they didn't want uh, him or her to understand what was being uh, said. Uh, most likely, if they grew up on a farm, for sure, all the machinery would have been mechanized. It would have been gasoline-powered machinery. Most likely, they didn't weren't brought up on a farm. Most likely, they didn't want to stay on the farm. They wanted to get off the farm. Uh, and so it's a, a very uh, different kind of group. If they were on the farm, uh, they certainly were using gasoline-powered machinery. Uh, they would have had a telephone. They would have had electricity. Uh, they would have, um, and eventually, uh, the internet. Uh, they would have been immersed in a modern uh, economic culture. Uh, they would have been involved in commercial farming, most likely as over the course of their lives they shifted more and more to a single crop. Uh, usually what's grown here is uh, wheat, alfalfa, uh, rye, or uh, corn, especially corn, uh, and the corn is used as feed for cows. It's not really not so good. I don't think it tastes all that good for humans. It's used as feed for uh, cows, and then there's a dairy industry. and. Uh, their great-great-grandfather in the 1870s and 80s would have pretty much lived off the farm in terms of food. Uh, they would not be living off the farm. They'd be going to Giant to buy their meals, uh, and then uh, they would have had a garden perhaps, but they would have uh, sold most of their uh, food and then used the money to buy food. So it's a very different person uh, who's at this festival than it would have been uh, 72 years ago. And as the festival has uh, evolved in that sense, uh, some criticism of the festival that uh, it does not show what are those pre-industrial uh, farming techniques, that pre-industrial life. There are some exhibits that do that, uh, but there are also a lot of other uh, exhibits as well. Uh, but keep in mind, the material that we have 
is not the same that we had uh, in 1950. And this festival has evolved along those lines. One thing um, that I'd like to talk about is, um, I talked about this earlier, if anybody was here earlier, languages and cultures to survive must uh, evolve. And so sometimes people talk about, um, for instance, Latin as a dead language. Um, well, Latin isn't really a dead language. It's Spanish, French, Italian. It's something that changed. What's dead is when something freezes. And the argument is uh, that could be the true of a language, it could be true of a culture. Um, when people change, uh, when they are creative, they actually keep something alive. And one of the things you'll hear at, down at this festival is we're finding ways uh, to keep Pennsylvania the Dutch culture alive. Uh, one of the things is, uh, if you were here earlier, there was a liars contest. Um, that really does not go back to Germany. It actually doesn't even go back to the 1800s. That seems to be something, well, took off in English actually in the late 1800s. Americans like telling tall tales, stories, things like that. Um, and then the Pennsylvania Dutch uh, picked up on that. Uh, and then that became actually one of the main expressive forms uh, for the language. There's a group of Groundhog Lodges. Uh, they meet annually. They started in the 1930s. Um, and you can only speak Pennsylvania Dutch. Again, that's not something that goes back to Germany. In fact, a lot of the symbolism in the Groundhog Lodges is derived from Masonic Lodges, uh, which would be American. Uh, they took that American experience, uh, combined it with Pennsylvania Dutch culture. Uh, they speak uh, the language, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch. They're, in fact, if you speak any English, you get fined. Uh, and they've taken a lot of uh, kind of American uh, memes and symbols and uh, joking humor uh, but they've combined it into Pennsylvania Dutch. Now, you could say, well, Pennsylvania, these uh, Groundhog Lodges, that's not something that goes back to Germany. It's not even something that goes before about 1930. Uh, and yet that's become part of uh, their cultural expression. Uh, so one of the things as you look around here, uh, what you'll see is uh, a lot of craftspeople who are taking traditional Pennsylvania German arts and then modernizing them, changing them uh, to fit with the times. And um, one of the things is, uh, I like to talk about the hex signs as an example of this, the barn stars. Um, if you see that word shirk, uh, that is a classic uh, barn star that you will find on barns in this area. Tourists started coming up in this area in the 1930s and 40s. By the 1950s, there was a big industry. And what happened is the hex signs started evolving, if you want, uh, to be to tourists. Tourists generally like a lot of frills, a lot of little things along the side. They don't like the more simpler. Uh, what would have been traditional things, and a lot of the hexine makers uh, evolved with that.
that's lemonade. third generation sharing in my family and uh, next year I'll actually be sharing my 50th year at this year so uh, I didn't think I'd be sharing that long but uh, just the way uh, things have happened over the years uh, my father taught me I uh, he shared for 37 years at this year and my great-grandfather he started all he started sharing in 1896 uh, in this area he was a dairy farmer and he was also a veterinarian. And uh, when she got introduced, he had a few himself. He said he was doing everything else for the local farmers, animal-wise. He decided he was gonna start shearing. And this is actually one of his hand pieces that he was shearing with. We're gonna show you some hand shearing, uh, part of the demonstration. Uh, I don't know exactly how long he sheared by hand, uh, but I would say three quarters of his career he, was, he sheared by hand. And, uh, he shared for 40, uh, 43 years, he shared. Um, my grandfather never got into it. Uh, he helped with other functions, wrapping up wool and stuff like that, uh, but he never shared. He, uh, as a young man, he fell off the uh, family uh, hayloft in the barn and uh, his back landed on a scale. Uh, in fact, he kind of broke his back and I got very rude way diffused it back then. Uh, he just could take the, the pressure and the bending over like we do uh, so we can uh, do our job. So he never shared. A good friend of the family was taught. Uh, he shared for many, he shared 
probably 40 years, I would say. Um, he was a friend of the family. He helped on the family farm. His name was Luther Sugar. And uh, my dad actually learned uh, under him. Um, he went along with him to, uh, when he was uh, learning to share when he was a young man. The gentleman's going to be doing the sharing as the oldest of my three boys. Uh, this is Chris. Uh, he's with me 30 years as a shear. Uh, when he's not doing this, he is also a mason uh, by trade. And uh, he also, in the fall, uh, he also uh, coaches uh, one of the top uh, cross country teams in the state at Northwestern Lehigh. Uh, he's doing that for 20 some years, over 20 uh, years. So, my middle son was a shear also. I thought we had an extra hand there. And uh, it's something he always wanted to do. We've seen it coming. Uh, when he was a young boy, he was always uh, fascinated with military. Um, he's serving our country right now. He's in his 13th year. Uh, last month, we just went down to Camp Lejeune. Uh, he just got his dream job. That's what he says he always wanted to do. He's now an artillery officer. He has his own battalion of guns, 16 guns he has under his command. And uh, he's a U.S. Marine. Uh, so he's uh, doing very well as an officer. And uh, he's hoping to finish his career at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, which the grandkids are a lot closer. Uh, they were in California at uh, Camp Pendleton, and uh, when he got a new command, he's over here. So a little easier to travel to see the grandkids. So uh, my youngest son, we're going to take he's going to share. Uh, again, he had, he had tried it. Uh, he just afraid with his knee. He had a really bad knee accident uh, when he was a senior in high school. And uh, uh, he's just afraid with, we, we use our knees and our thigh muscles a lot uh, during the shearing. He's just afraid he's gonna hurt it. And he didn't wanna go through that process. So I don't think we're gonna get him to shear. I did have two grandsons that were interested. They're kind of doing new things right now, trying to find themselves, I guess. Uh, the oldest one, he's actually in the US Army. Uh, he's, uh, he is actually an artillery gunner. He's one of the guys that shoot the, uh, shoots the round. So if they were in the same same organization, they probably be, might be together. But he's in the Army, my, son, my, my son's in the Marine Corps. Anyway, he's one of the 7,500 uh, Army uh, servicemen that got deployed from Fort Bag. So he's over, he's over in Ukraine. Uh, well, Germany, uh, Poland, we're not sure. It's kind of hush-hush where they're at. Uh, but hopefully we can get all those guys back home safe soon. So that's where he's at. And then my middle grandson, his son, he's been helping around uh, here and there. Uh, we didn't get a share in his hand yet, but he's actually, a, uh, he just finished his first year. He's uh, uh, going to college. He's going into sales right now. So uh, we'll see where where it goes in the future. Maybe one of them will come back and and uh, well, we do have two younger grandsons down in Camp Lejeune, but they're only seven and five. So we have a long time to see if we can get one of those folks in, in the shear. Anyway, I'm gonna have my son start. Uh, we always start in the brisket and the belly. And the reason that she sat here while I was talking to you for a few minutes, we took their strength away from them. We need to take their strength away so they can do our job professionally. So that's why she said we have her legs up in the air. So she can uh, move there, and then my son will be uh, using his uh, knees and his thigh muscles to control the upper part of the body. So that's how, we're, that's how we control our an animal, so we can do our job. Now we always, again, we always start in the brisket in the belly. We need to open up the animal. Uh, usually there's not a lot of loose skin here, because the bellies are usually full, because uh, they, they do a lot of eating. Uh, so, again, he, he is sucking the skin and uh, to make sure we can get as much wool off. Now, this is a uh, four-year-old uh, that we're doing for you. Uh, this is a textile poly bay cross. Uh, it's a uh, cross between two trees. You give a nice medium weight fleece. Uh, this fleece would be used for clothing, uh, but it's a good, nice, medium grade. Uh, very nice uh, thick coat uh, that they keep produced. Uh, it's actually used for lambing, uh, for lambs. Uh, 
We can reduce these shoes every eight months. They only take five months for a lamb to be born, and we breed them uh, since they're on the farm. We breed them every eight months. Uh, we can do it for uh, life. Now you'll notice uh, he's doing a lot of tucking, he's doing a lot of stretching. These, uh, these animals are very fair skin. It's very easy to cut them if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so it takes experience uh, to be a professional. It takes about three years to be a pressure. About three seasons so you feel comfortable. So we see about 30 different breeds to see. We also see our llamas and pockets and gore goats in our trade. Now what we're doing now, we're coming up to next. We're just going to take a few, uh, few strokes coming up to next, because we don't know for sure if we have any wrinkles up in there. So it's mostly likely he's done there. Now he's going to put the, the neck right tight against his, uh, his uh, leg, pull the, the neck up, so that skin ties and tight. So I need to come down away from the animal and to come up towards the, uh, towards the animal. We can do the stretching a lot more easier. Now this will be the break, only break in the fleece. The fleece has to come off in one piece and get sold and graded. If it's not, it's considered tag. If it's considered tag, we'll use it as the industry, we'll make felt out of tag wool. It's usually the shortest and the dirtiest, so the process is a little different to make felt than it is to make uh, fun wool our back. Now at this point now, I see he's using his uh, palm. You might be seeing some wrinkles. Uh, that's why we shear the way we do. Because every stroke he takes, the wool will fall away from the animal. So cause we need to see that because it's very important to us when, we, uh, when you're running out of shear sheep. You need to see. So he's really sucking, sucking that skin. You can see above his head how much, how much wrinkles he has. So he's really telling that. So, our hard job is to get as much wool off this animal as it only done once a year. So we want to make it worthwhile for the producer uh, to get as much wool off. The other thing too is the fresh goats, we don't want to cut the animal. I mean, we do nick here and there, it just happens. The way this door, she moves suddenly, we you can see it. Uh, we do nick, we do have an accepted. Just like we put band-aids and that accepted on our custom and bruises. And so uh, every once in a while we will next. But I don't think I think he only has one cut all week. So he's doing a really good job this uh, week here. Now my great grandfather developed this method. Uh most of his flock, he was sure in my hands. He liked the sheep staying in one position. That meant we could have total control of the animal for the entire year. So he developed this method. We uh, decided as family members, we all could cheer left and right handed. So we just, the two our generations, taught the next generation to cheer this way, and we all have been doing fine. Both cheers, there's a couple different methods. Both cheers will cheer the entire sheet, right handed, we can call it the Australian method. Uh, there, the, the whole, the entire sheep will see if he's here. You have to turn the sheep. You got to turn the sheep so they can start from the hind corner and going up through. We're just coming down the opposite way, the way we did on the right side. It still comes off the same way. So we just developed that. We like the sheep in one position. Then we know it's a lot easier to control the animal if the sheep is in one position. Position. Now the one before, she was a little testy on him. He was trying to see what she was get away with. So he had a little more work trying to secure the animal, but he did a fantastic job and got her and got off job. Now he had this obedient break sleeves, like I said before. It wouldn't be used, uh, it wouldn't be used for clothing. It's not fine enough. Uh, your final wool sheep, they prefer a drier climate. And you'll see them more in the western part of the United States. Uh, we have two submarinos and mongolians in this area, but not many. They don't like the humidity. Uh, they don't do well in the humid climates. Uh, so they prefer a little more drier air, and you'll see a lot more of them out there. So what we're going to do, we're going to show you the rest of the sheep by hand. Uh, this is just the way my great-grandfather would have finished his sheep. Uh, again, uh, two reasons. The sheep is in a more natural state. We still have control of the animal because the feet are still off the ground. And uh, we can rest our backs in between shearings. 
A good day for my grandfather. It took him 20, 25 minutes to do one by hand. So he, he could do about 20 a day, comfortably, by hand. So that was a long day. Uh, with the equipment we now now and the uh, experience, uh, between the two of us, we can almost do that in an hour's time. And we do about 17, 18 an hour between the two of us. So that's how more efficient we are uh, shearing sheep now, uh, this time frame in the 1800s. So all we're doing is uh, doing it by hand. Uh, normally we'll finish the entire sheep by electric, uh, but we're just wanting to show you a little bit of hand shearing and you know, a little more uh, intense. Now he's picking, he's just seen that again. We, uh, there's a tension point right right there at the hind quarter. He stopped the, the kick right away. So uh, that comes with experience. And uh, uh, you want to learn the best way to do it is have, uh, go on, come under somebody like ourselves with the experience. You'll learn how to shear sheep a lot faster than trying to go through videos or because videos will just show you just the basics, they're not going to show you the little tricks in the train of holding a sheep if a sheep kicks or if you have a wrinkle, what are you supposed to do with that? They, they don't show you that on videos or textbooks. So, now, like I said, most of our wool here in Pennsylvania, we have basically no big mills in Pennsylvania, even on the East Coast. Uh, we do have a mid sized uh, mill uh, down in South Carolina that some wool pools deal with. But most of us deal with a, uh, a mill out in Illinois, um, and uh, they buy they buy a lot of this because they have two uh, companies they process wool for that uses a lot of this type of wool. So they buy and they come in here uh, probably eight times, eight times in, during the season, starting in uh, May, and ending with our pool. Our pool is always in October uh, here, and uh, so they'll come in. They, seven, eight times to the different pool areas in the state of Pennsylvania, get it all trucked in. And uh, two of their major contributors that day is Burlington. Burlington still uses a lot of wool in their rug making. They use a lot of medium grade fleeces. The other company that uses a lot of medium grade fleeces is Rawlings. If you open this up and unravel the ball, there's 212 yards of spun fiber in every baseball made. So we play a big part in the core, core of the baseball. So uh, we are trying different things. The wool industry is like we've found them out since COVID. Uh, three years ago, we could get 80, 85 cents a pound for our fleeces. Right now, we're lucky if we get 10 cents. The wool industry, we have found them out. I've never seen in the 49 years I've been involved in sheep, it was this bad. So the uh, reason, main reason, the world buyers, India and China, are world leaders in wool buying and production, and they're not buying nothing. Uh, they're still, I think China, I think half of China still shut down. There's a new variant uh, developing over there, and a lot of their countries still shut down yet. So hopefully they keep it over there, right? So, um, so until they get back in their economy and that, you know, our warehouses are so full. That's why. We're getting nothing for our wool because we still have two, three years worth of wool in warehouses. So, but the animals still got to get sheared every year. So, uh, we do have an issue uh, trying to uh, get rid of our wool. We are trying new products uh, locally uh, in the United States. Uh, we have some uh, guys down in South Carolina. We're actually we're trying to get we're trying to get into the green hole industry. Uh, wool is a very good insulator. And uh, there's guys that are trying to develop wool into bats. And that's what's going in your wall for wall insulation. Uh, it's a very good insulator. It doesn't burn. Wool does not burn naturally. And uh, it, it doesn't attract bugs and insects. So it's a really good product. And uh, so we are trying to get the And there's here. Did I get an issue? Always do it. <laughs> Always do it. Uh, we try not to feed them in the morning so they don't do it, but they might be they must be sneaking some hay through the through the gate. So anyway, uh, again, this is a uh, she was born in seventeen. She was born in seventeen, so she's uh, she has uh, like five, six, eight years on the farm yet to be a producing you. 
and uh, so she'll be around a little bit, and uh, you'll see a yellowish tint to it, I never mentioned it, is what we call lanolin. This is where it comes from. So uh, once they wash the wool at the mills, the wool will liquefy, we'll skim that, and that goes in your hand creams and soap. Now she's pretty lanolin herself. I'll bring the fleece up if you want to feel it. It's a little on the oil and it feel sticky to you. It'll cling, it'll cling to your uh, hands. Uh, but this is where the process is when they wash it. That's how they get the oil in out of the fleece. So if there's any other questions I can answer. If not, if there's no other questions, you're welcome to come up. I'll bring the fleece up here. I hope you enjoyed the program. Have a great day here. It's a good time for Festival. Thank you.